Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Wellbe Show and Podcast. I am thrilled to have uh, Dr. Fred Barrett with me today. He's a cognitive neuroscientist and the acting director of the Center for Psychedelic and Consciousness Research at Johns Hopkins University. Fred, welcome. Thank you for coming on the show. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm happy to happy to be here. Right. Well, um, for a little bit of background, Wellbe, a company that I started, focused a lot on um, root cause resolution medicine, um, as well as natural medicines, um, and just really a more um, holistic approach to connecting diseases and chronic illness um, with symptoms and, and understanding where they really come from. So um, psychedelics are really interesting to me because they're medicine, right? They're not like um, figuring out you have a gluten sensitivity, right? But they are plant-based and natural and um, have had a really interesting history in the United States and across the world over the last 50, 60 years. There's been some fantastic books and um, documentaries and stuff recently about this change from um, this horrible illegal substance to something that's um, so profoundly helpful for, for mental illness. Um, so I have a lot of questions about it. First of all, um, what exactly are psychedelics in contrast to like a pharmaceutical psychiatric drug, for example, and why are they so important in the field of mental health right now? These are great questions. And um, I, I want to preface by kind of just uh, kind of addressing the controversy, maybe teaching the controversy rather than giving a straight answer. Uh, you know, I, I've asked a number of principals at, at big pharmaceutical companies, what is a drug? And they say, well, you know, it's, you know, I've, I've gotten various answers. Maybe the best answer so far has been, you know, a ligand that binds to a receptor. And they say, oh, that's interesting. Well, you know, the, there are many, so is, are, are neurotransmitters drugs? Well, no, 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 an, exo an exogenous ligand. So something that comes from outside of your body, goes into your body, and then binds to a receptor. And I said, okay, well, that's, that's interesting, but, you know, that seems to be leaving something on the table. Is, is you know, why, why are some things called drugs while others uh, are not? You know, what is, what is, what is an illegal drug? What, why are drugs legal or illegal? Why are they considered to be good or bad? Um, you know, one, one of the mentors for the, the research unit out of which the Psychedelic Center emerged, the Behavioral Pharmacology Research Unit, used to say, you know, the poison's in the dose. I feel the word drug has gotten a bad rep. I feel that, um, you know, separating drugs into good and bad drugs, legal or illegal drugs or other things kind of also brings brings the wrong perspective to this. I, I think that, and I'm not saying that you bring this perspective. I'm, I'm just trying to paint my perspective of how this all how this all works you know many pharmaceutical drugs that have been developed for the treatment of psych of mental health issues um, have come through this kind of long pipeline of of chemistry and pharmacology leading, leading into you know, early clinical trials that get into humans and then eventually you find something that may or may not work well or poorly in terms of addressing a mental health problem you know one of the most common drugs we have on the market today for treating patients with depression is, uh, you know, falls in the class of selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. It's a class of drugs that essentially binds to places in the brain that naturally regulate the, the, the normal level of serotonin that you have in your brain with the fear. One of the theories being that people who are suffering from, from mood disorders, for instance, don't have enough serotonin and, and maybe by, by just, you know, increasing the amount of serotonin people have in their brain, you are somehow uh, alleviating the symptoms. It turns out that these drugs in some form have been around for decades. There are some people who frankly wouldn't be here if it weren't for SSRIs. And we have to acknowledge and respect that. But we also have to acknowledge and respect the fact that there are vast numbers of people for whom these drugs do not work. They do not, um, you know, fully and adequately relieve someone of their depressive symptoms and 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 right there there's there's something to unpack as well you know relieving someone of symptoms uh of, of of a mood disorder for instance or at least you know reducing those symptoms of a mood disorder doesn't always treat the problem that's not that's not you know getting to you know, a phrase you just used root cause of of illness and and and, and lack of flourishing and lack of well-being some have criticized 
SSRIs and other antidepressant drugs as, you know, blunting things rather than fixing them. And, and you know, having many family members who, who have suffered from mood disorders and friends and, and loved ones. Um, yeah, sometimes it just makes things dull rather than making them bright. And psychiatric drugs on mass don't necessarily address why someone may have found themselves in a depressive episode to begin with. Um, in addition, you know, so many typical kind of pharmaceutical solutions to mood disorders, uh, whether or not they work fully or partially, um, can often come with some pretty horrid side effects. Um, you know, uh, horrid in terms of its long-term impact on the individual, a lot of weight gain or weight loss, you know, la lack of, you know, loss of finding pleasure in things that would normally find pleasure in, you know, lack of you know, libido, sleep problems, too much or not enough. And all of these things can really add up to, to really wear on a person in a much different fashion than, than their original mood disorder had worn on them. And, and, and many of these states are not things that people can sustain. So I think, you know, we can make an argument that some good things have come out of the medical model of treating mood disorders outside of psychotherapy. Um, but, you know, there's an awful lot of work that still needs to be done to helping people. And wasn't there a large meta-analysis that came out in 2022 about the lack of evidence, really, that that the serotonin theory of depression really exists? Or I, I remember reading about it and and seeing that there kind of wasn't a real case for the idea that SSRIs could, um, you know, really boost serotonin in people because serotonin wasn't the thing that was necessarily responsible for the depression. So I thought that was fascinating and very timely with all the work that's being done in the psychedelic world. I'm really glad you brought that up. And it's a really important paper to discuss, if, even if just briefly. We really don't know how most drugs work in terms of like, <laughs> you know, really precise mechanisms in the brain or the mind or the body. And, uh, you know, a lot of pharmacological medicine rests on simple outcomes research, right? Like we give this drug to a person, what happens? We give this drug to a thousand people, what happens? Do enough of them get better with as least amount of risk as possible? And is it is it as good as or better than what we have already? Those are in, in really broad and, and kind of granular, a granular strokes, the way that the decisions are made, you know, the FDA doesn't require that anybody really know exactly how a drug works for them to approve it. They have to know the risk benefit ratio and, 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 you know, in comparison to standard of care, whatever that may or may not be at the time. So, so, so there's a little bit of a straw man here that's been set up by this paper. I, I did describe in, in, in broad strokes the serotonin hypothesis of depression. And I think what that paper was suggesting was, you know, hey, there's no evidence that the drugs are doing what we think they're doing in that serotonin hypothesis. Maybe the serotonin hypothesis is half baked, half baked or not baked at all. And, and that's very, that very well could be true that, that, you know, we shouldn't throw out the baby with the bathwater, but that doesn't mean that SSRIs haven't helped people. It just means that like the story we all like to tell, which, yeah, I just regurgitated, frankly, um, may not really be the true story. Right. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't continue to use these drugs to try to help people. But but yeah, but yeah, it, it, the, the reasoning may be flawed and, and, and the model and, and part, part of that part of what that paper kind of showed is that, you know, really over, oversimplified models of how drugs work in the brain are usually not true. Got frankly. it. Um, OK, so yeah, so I, I, I'll, I'll, I'll apologize for regurgitating that kind of, that, that almost, you know, I don't want to call it a fairy tale. I don't want to call it a myth, but like, you know, that probably, you know, under justified understanding of how SSRIs work in the brain, but how they, I mean, they, they, they probably do change levels of serotonin in the brain. That might not be the only factor to having an antidepressant response to SSRIs. Got it. All right. So, right. so in contrast to this really, uh, unknown, <laughs> but popular uh, field yeah. of SSRI medication. Um, what, how do psychedelics act differently on the brain and why are we seeing more, uh, I think we're seeing more success, right? With some of the trials that are being done. Those are two separate questions, which I'll, I will answer separately. How psychedelics work in the brain is still uh, an area of active research. And there are a lot of interesting ideas out there, and they may be true. I think 
just as much as the serotonin hypothesis of SSRIs treating depression uh, is a, an oversimplified model that is certainly not the whole story. We only have tiny little bits and pieces and fragments of the story with psychedelics, but this is what we think so far. One of the hypotheses about how psychedelics work in the brain, and, and I want to separate this discussion into the acute effects of psychedelics on the brain, like what's happening in your brain when you're having a psychedelic experience. And then the kind of longer term effects, what happens when drug effects wear off, I like to say, you know, when you go back to paying your taxes and getting stuck in traffic, what changes have occurred that are supporting radical behavior change and, and, and mood state change and all these other things. We know a lot more about the former rather th than we do about the latter, but let's start with what we think we know. You know, one of the, one of the first uh, studies done with brain imaging in psychedelics uh, was, was con you know, was conducted in the 90s in, in Switzerland and, and found that during psychedelic experiences, by and large, using drugs, including uh, mescaline, which is the psychoactive component of many species of psychoactive cacti, and psilocybin, which is the, the psychoactive component in over, you know, hundreds of species of, of psychoactive mushroom, um, <clears throat> you know, use, using these drugs, uh, they, they found overall kind of a hyperfrontality, if you will, you know, a great increase in, in activity of uh, prefrontal brain regions, and also possibly, you know, the thalamus, which is a bit of a sensory kind of way station or switchboard in the brain. And from these initial imaging studies in the 90s, uh, people began to think, well, this is interesting, you know, with, with the history of psychedelics, like back in the 50s and 60s, when psychedelics were first introduced to the clinic and the lab, a lot of the people who were studying them were psychiatrists or psychologists. And one of the first things they thought they noticed was that, you know, elements of psychedelic experience, at least in their minds, began to mimic aspects of psychosis. And so, you know, early on, psychedelic drugs were called psychotomimetics or drugs that mimic psychosis. And um, following from that tradition and that history, you know, folks who are doing these, these couple initial studies in the 90s, began to think, well, you know, we see hyperfrontality in, in patients who are experiencing psychosis, you know, patients with schizophrenia or others, uh, and we're seeing this hypo, hyperfrontality with psychedelic drugs. Well, this is all lining up quite well. The thalamus is really almost like a filter. It, you know, if we were to try to attend to all of the sensory information that's bombarding us constantly throughout our lives, we'd be overwhelmed and we never would be able to go about the world humaning, right? Like, attending to things, making decisions, acting appropriately. None of that would work if we were actually trying to process everything that we're sensing, the feeling of the chair on our, on our, you know, legs and our backside, you know, the sound of the HVAC in the background, or, you know, that nagging itch on your knee because you have a mosquito bite, right? All of those things are going to distract you from listening to this podcast. But, um, you know, the thalamus helps us filter some of that stuff out so we can intend to what's important and, and continue to act and behave appropriately in the world. So the, the thought was, you know, the prefrontal cortex provides input to the thalamus to help us decide what's important to attend to. Then the thalamus feeds the important sensory information forward so we can make decisions about it and go about our lives. And basically psychedelics break down that filter, whether or not they open up the thalamus or they stop the prefrontal cortex from providing that input. One of one or the other of those things happens that leads to kind of the, the cortex being overwhelmed with sensory information, which further breaks down the control, which further leads to a flood of information. And then everything follows from that. So that was one of the earlier models of what's happening in the brain when we're having a psychedelic experience. I think that model still holds water. It still could explain, you know, take, taking out of the equation, the word psycho, psychotomimetic, I think there are a lot of really good arguments for why psychedelics do not mimic you know, psychosis. And, and, and there are a lot of good arguments for why other drugs could lead to much more kind of clean models of psychosis. But putting all of that aside, I think the general premise that these circuits may be disrupted in the brain really, you know, could, could explain some of the acute effects of psychedelic drugs, but not all of them. Um, more recently, there were, there were functional MRI studies, the first one conducted at, Imp at Imperial College London, that looked at uh, blood flow and, 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 and other markers of brain activity, and they found something completely different. They found, you know, when, when, when injecting psilocybin uh, intravenously, a really remarkable reduction in blood flow and brain activity overall, but, but, but most concentrated in regions of the brain called the default mode network. And uh, this, this kind of came on the heels of 
a theoretical article that the first author, Robin Carter Harris, of that initial study had published. He published a couple of years before that a theoretical article suggesting that the default mode network was really the seat of the ego, the neural basis of the ego. And uh, this this seems to follow as well. I, I believe Robin's earlier training was in psychoanalysis. I am not enough of an expert in psychoanalysis to give you know a good critique or support of that, except you know my 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 really kind of uh, naive understanding of the ego uh and and if we were to try to find a brain network that that was the seed of the ego i would have guessed other things like the executive control network or, or attention networks in the brain kind of networks that are involved in paying attention to stuff out there and making decisions about stuff out there rather than the default mode network which has been typically associated with introspection kind of autobiographical memories also theory of mind my theory of your mind you know each of these processes and, and really self-referential processing uh, maybe, maybe that is the ego, but but the story went that, hey, um, psychedelics in this case in, with these data seem to be turning down or turning off the default mode network. Um, maybe that's really the neural basis of what people describe as ego disillusion during psychedelic experiences or you know changes in a sense of self or a perception that the self, whatever that is, goes away for a period of time. Uh, it's a compelling idea, a compelling theory uh, that I think, uh, you know, caught people's attention and really got people excited like wow we're really we're really learning something now about the brain and the mind brain connection in the same way that i don't think the thalamus account of psychedelic experiences really describes all or even most of what happens during a psychedelic experience i, I think that the default mode network theory could also have some some flaws um what we've known about resting state brain networks that you can detect from MRI and other imaging methods for 30 or more years is that when people are doing stuff out there in the world, responding to stimuli out in the world, making decisions and behavioral responses out in the world, there are a series of brain networks that, that come online when appropriate to, resp to, to, to act in those situations. Those are called task positive networks networks that are on when you're on task and tasking out there these these are executive control decision making networks attention networks sensory processing networks um, what we've known from you know for decades now is that when those networks turn on the default mode network typically turns off and when you're not attending to stuff out there those networks turn off and the default mode network turns on so if you were to tell me that you have a drug that uh, evokes this, this wildly uh, exciting and compelling and, and uh, atypical sensory experience with geometric overlays or kaleidoscopic imagery overlaid on your visual field, sometimes even complex imagery, you know, a, a change in interoception and proprioception, the way your body feels and the way that the world seems and the way that you interact with it. And, and, and if that was coupled by, you know, potentially alterations of cognitive processes, changing the way, the speed and the manner in which you think, uh, and 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 decision making behavior. If you told me you had a drug that wildly shifted all of these processes, uh, and you said, "What do you think's happening in the brain?" I'd say, "Well, you know, probably all these task positive networks are turning on." And and, and if we know anything about the brain, it's when these task positive networks turn on, the default mode networks turns off. I think I think it's been an, an interesting theory that the default mode network is really at the center of psychedelic experiences but it the, the very reasonable alternative hypothesis hasn't been really adequately addressed that it's it's really the default mode network turning off because all of these other things are turning on strongly and if you look at almost all of the uh, studies that have reported a reduction in default mode network activity and connectivity acutely if, if they don't selectively report only on default mode network and they report on the activity of other networks almost all of them uh, report greater, you know, is similar if not greater effects in other brain networks. So, you know, it, 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 the default mode network doesn't exist in isolation. All of these other things are going on. I think, you know, a theory that I've been working on with a couple colleagues here at Hopkins and the University of Maryland um, comes out of work on a really kind of esoteric brain region called the claustrum. And this is claustrum, not colostrum. It's not breast milk. It's a brain region. And I sometimes get some confusion there, so I want to make that clear. But um, the, the, the executive summary here is that um, it, it's a brain region that's been difficult to study until recently. It's a brain region that is one of the most highly interconnected brain regions to all other brain regions. And it turns out the claustrum is only transiently active. And through research that I and others have conducted, uh, primarily my, my colleague Brian Mather and he and his trainees and colleagues at the University of Maryland have demonstrated quite nicely now that 
The claustrum only seems to be taught transiently active at the transition from doing something easy to doing something difficult. And with some further research uh, conducted in Brian's lab, uh, specifically by Human Kadir, uh, they, they found that it's, we, at this point, we believe the claustrum may be responsible for, uh, for essentially allowing us to switch brain network states from one state to another to respond to changing demands in the environment. I'm almost there. I'm going to bring you home now. So imagine you have a brain structure, you know, that is, that is responsible for taking your current brain state and pulling it apart and reconstituting it into another brain network state in order to respond to a changing demand in the environment, right? I'm, I'm sitting down, I'm, I'm typing furiously, I'm writing a paper, uh, and then someone comes into my office and says something and I have to stop turn, listen, who is this person? What the heck are they saying? And what do they want out of me? Okay, yes, I can respond to this now. You know, that 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 requires a radical shift in brain network states to, to and so we believe the claustrum may be doing that. Turns out the claustrum is one of the brain regions that most highly expresses the serotonin 2A receptor, which we believe uh, all classic psychedelic drugs bind to. And when we block activity at that receptor, it seems to block all of the classic subjective effects we associate with a psychedelic experience. So, you know, we believe that, you know, the 2A receptor is really responsible for mediating the psychedelic experience and the claustrum contains a ton of 2A receptors. So uh, if we, you know, uh, administer a psychedelic drug to someone, and there's a high chance that we can disrupt claustrum function and essentially take, you know, it's almost like taking the chief of staff out of the office. And so no one knows what meeting they're supposed to show up to when or where or who they're meeting with, what the agenda items are. And so essentially, uh, we found this at least initial evidence for this. Uh, you know, I, I published the first inhuman study showing psychedelic effects in the claustrum. Psychedelics reduce claustrum activity. They reduce the degree to which the claustrum communicates with brain networks. So this may be the first step in a, a disorganization of the brain that, that could occur during psychedelic experiences. And this ties back to some other work published out of Imperial College London and, and, and with their colleagues suggesting that the organization of brain network space really changes radically. You know, there are many more brain network states that possibly come into play during psychedelic experiences. They don't look like typical brain network state, states in normal waking consciousness. And, and, and more importantly, I think what may be happening here is that you know, people report a lack of control of the experience sometimes, especially with high doses of psychedelics, like, and, and, and when people feel like they should have some control, but can't exert that control over their thought processes. Uh, that's when a lot of people can begin to struggle with psychedelic experiences. But um, I think this is all speaking to potential effects of psychedelics and disrupting our ability to, to maintain and control our brain network state space, which then leads to all of the other things. Um, but what is what does any of this mean? <laughs> why 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 is any of this important? It sounds like some interesting and esoteric nerdy stuff that you're saying, Doctor Bear. But why do any of us care, and why is any of this important? Well, here's here's where I think it really gets interesting. Some of our behavioral evidence and 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 evidence from careful testing and and, and questionnaires and qualitative investigation of people's experiences of when they've uh, you know been been administered these drugs. Uh, both healthy people and, and patients being, you know, studied to see if we can treat mental health issues with these drugs. Um, people often report encountering some often unexpected, you know, deeply personally meaningful psychological insight that they've encountered during during this uh, this experience that then kind of feeds their healing process, whatever that ends up being. Uh, even even healthy individuals, you know, who who undergo these experiences. Um, can find an increase in well-being and, and life satisfaction and, and relief from uh, anxiety or other mood states that, that are, are kind of wearing on them, you know, thinking of moving in the direction of increased flourishing. You know, it's, it, it may be that these psychological insights are what's driving at least the storytelling about you know, healing and well-being that follows these experiences. And it could be that in this chaotic brain state where we don't have this, the control over our mindset that we're used to, that um, previously learned maladaptive mental behaviors that keep us in a rut of negative rumination or that, <clears throat> or that drive us to making certain assumptions rather than others about our relationships or a place in the world, that 
you know, these uh, for, for, for a short period of time don't have control over us anymore. And that allows us to kind of, uh, you know, uh, really entertain other ideas about how all of this should work or how who we are or what that means. And, uh, you know, it's, it's so so this this kind of feeds into a, a, a theory that that uh, Robin Carhart Harris has, has has focused on, which is the entropic brain or, or relaxation of beliefs under psychedelics. You know, it's possible that some form of relaxation of our prior beliefs leads us to a state in which we can entertain new beliefs that then kind of take hold and and have purchase in our minds. Uh, I think how that works long term. There are two two stories that I want to weave into this now that I think explain this. One is uh, with medic control and the learned value of control. So so this is, a, I'll give a shameless plug for a paper that uh, my, my postdoctoral fellow Jada Sayala and, and I just published in Neuron at the beginning of the year, uh, the journal Neuron. Um, essentially, the, the meta control describes a process by which we adaptively shift between cognitive flexibility and cognitive stability in 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 our lives and in responding to things that we need to do in the environment. You can imagine a lot of situations in which you need stability, sitting down to, to write a paper or read a book. Um, you know, you need cognitive stability. You need to be stable in in one cognitive state to have sustained attention addressing a task, right? And there are other situations in which you need a lot of cognitive flexibility, like driving through hectic traffic, right? You need to be able to respond uh, flexibly to, to really rapidly changing and unexpected things in the environment. And really, meta control is the process by which we manage that shift between flexibility and stability. And patients who are suffering de from depression or substance use disorders, they could be described in part as suffering possibly from a lack of meta control or, or a maladaptive application of meta control where mostly people are, uh, you know, find themselves in, in a maladaptive state of stability over flexibility, right? And this can be described behaviorally in terms of uh, compulsive drug seeking in, in, within patients who are suffering from substance use disorders or, you know, yeah, stuck in, in, in loops of negative rumination in patients who are suffering from mood disorders, right? And, 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 and the theory that the Jada kind of lays out uh, is essentially that we, um, by having these experiences that throw us into a radically flexible state during a psychedelic experience, that, uh, you know, on a molecular or a neural or even a psychological level, we, we begin to relearn the value of flexibility. And, you know, you can think of coming from a, a, a deeply stable, maladaptively stable state to, you know, a short period of possibly radical flexibility that then levels off in the middle and then going forward after these experiences people are able to exert a greater amount of flexibility or at least shifting more adaptively between flexibility and stability where they weren't able to do so before and we've we've shown some brief evidence for this possibly in, in our patients treated for major depressive disorder they've uh, we, we we've shown careful behavioral evidence that, pa that, that these patients after treatment with psilocybin have a notable increase in the capacity for cognitive flexibility, the capacity for thinking more adaptively or changing the way you think about yourself or your place in the world or make or decision making, you know, capacity. And so we have behavioral evidence for this. We have some evidence in in in, in brain imaging studies that we've conducted in the same patients. To begin to answer your second question, which is like vaguely, you know, why are we excited about these drugs? What are they doing to help people? Uh, you know. We're finding outside of all of this kind of esoteric neuroscience and cognitive psychology, at the end of the day, uh, you know, when when these compounds are administered to properly screened individuals in an environment in which they feel safe, they've been prepared as much as possible for the experience, uh, and they, they're having these experiences in the presence of of two uh, trained therapists who with whom they've built trust and rapport. And those are therapists that are going to work with a participant afterwards to help integrate the experience into their lives and help them move forward. Under these conditions, we're seeing some really remarkable effect sizes in treating patients, at least with mood disorders, patients with substance use disorders. And now there are a wide range of studies that are being conducted in a, in a, in a great number of indications. Here at Hopkins, we're conducting studies in patients with obsessive compulsive disorder, Alzheimer's dementia, post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. I'm conducting a study, a large clinical trial in patients with depression and co-occurring alcohol use disorder, which is more the rule rather than the exception out in the world with people who are suffering from either. They're often suffering also from a smaller, large piece of the other. Lyme is a important topic to me and my uh, I know Dr. John Alcott and his work at at Hopkins pretty well. So um, I'm curious about, about that because he and I talk 
quite a bit about, you know, post-treatment or chronic Lyme and um, how he's one of the few in the medical establishment who's saying the medical establishment has it wrong. So I'm curious how the psychedelics are playing into that. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. And so, um, you know, there, are, there are a couple angles here um, and the studies being, uh, you know, the principal investigators on that are uh, Dr. Albert Garcia Ramu and Dr. John Alcott. Um, and so we're, you know, the Psychedelic Research Center is collaborating with the Lyme Research Center here at Hopkins to, to conduct this study. The uh, jury is still out. Um, we are, you know, we're in the middle, really directly in the middle of, of, of subject recruitment. I think we've recruited half of the, the intended sample. And no analyses have been conducted yet, so I can't say anything definitive. And I wouldn't want to preempt Al or, or, or John in, in kind of reporting any of that. But suffice to say, some of the rationale was and still is treating some of the existential crisis that occurred you know, uh, secondary to, and not, not quite an existential crisis in the same way as with a late stage cancer diagnosis, but, you know, the, the struggle and the depression and, and the affective components and of kind of living with post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. That's been an initial target of this study and, and uh, acknowledging also the growing literature suggesting at least peripheral uh, potential for anti-inflammatory effects of psychedelic drugs. You know what? What are what other potential overlaps here? Are there other kind of non-psychiatric biological mechanisms by which psychedelics could affect patients with post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome? I'm, I'm not sure I can say any more than that, except that we're really excited about the study and, and really excited to see where it goes. That's that's great, because um, I mean, yeah, I, I don't know anybody that's gone through a chronic or a post-treatment Lyme battle that isn't kind of made depressed by it because it goes on for so long and it's very hopeless. Um, and there doesn't seem to be a lot of light at the end of the tunnel. So if there's some way to, you know, use the brain rewiring or whatever our, you know, understanding of the psychedelic effect on it to at least get you, get your brain on the, on your team uh, to try to help, um, with overcoming and doing the work that it takes to get over post-treatment Lyme, which is a lot of not strict lifestyle regimen, but, you know, you really have to take care of yourself for a very long period of time in order to see improvement. And I think when you get depressed, it's hard to do that. So yeah, that's, that's fascinating to me. So I just want to back up for a second and say, how did you get into this area? Obviously you, you know, went through, training that didn't have to do with psychedelics and then you ended up here but you know what what drew you to it yeah um i I like to tell people that i got into this by accident uh i i uh had initially studied uh, in grad school um the cognitive neuroscience of of music perception and cognition overall the the what drew me to this field and and this research uh and what what fueled my interest in it uh, was was a, a deep and profound excitement and, and, and interest in in understanding uh, states of consciousness. You know, I, I had had a, a bit of a meditation practice, somewhat non traditional meditation practice, for periods of my life. I had also been a professional musician for periods of my life, um, and uh, you know, playing on stage at a professional level with with a good group of musicians can lead to some rather profound altered states of consciousness, um, uh, some of which include and, 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 and mimic kind of like a flow state or, or being in the groove or, 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 you know, a really a no self type of situation, but yet s- still deeply emotionally kind of laden and, and um, meditation states and, 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 and dabbling with kind of, uh, you know, uh, those type of practices can lead you to other altered states of consciousness. I, I also studied, uh, Aikido uh, for uh, for a number of years, and the active art of practicing Aikido uh, can lead to altered states of consciousness, and, and really, you know, always having a kind of fundamental fascination with these states drew me initially, kind of to to studying music and and and, and trying to understand the, the powerful impact that music listening can have on on us. You know, people every day use music to kind of help them regulate their emotions and. Uh, and you know, even even without playing on some playing an instrument or being on stage, uh, you know, I think it, I hope it's not a lost art. You know, people can still resonate with it. But the, the practice of deep listening, like you know, closing closing the door, turning off the lights, you know, 
lowering the blinds and, and closing your eyes and just like listening to a record from start to finish and doing nothing but completely focusing on that record and what it brings up on you. There's there so many different kind of practices here that uh, can can change our minds in, in, in subtle ways. You know, I, I was initially motivated to get into cognitive neuroscience by, by the, the hope or the, or the kind of uh, potential of using music as a tool to study the mind and the brain. And that's what I got into in grad school. But, but you know, the music is just one tool. MRIs and EEG systems, they're just tools. And psychedelics are just, I mean, on one, on one hand, they're just another tool. But on the other hand, they're a very, very powerful tool. Right. Do you think the fact that psychedelics come from, I mean, not to get hippy dippy, but come from the earth, right? Um, and we come from the earth, um, that there's a connection there that makes it more effective than using a, you know, human created chemical substance on the brain. Do you think there's something there about that that makes it more um, like like meets like, you know, like they recognize each other better? I'll take it back to Lyme, Dr. Alcott, uh research and a lot of what Hopkins has seen shows herbs are so incredibly impactful for, for Lyme um, in a way that other things kind of haven't been able to be. They just take longer to work. I wonder if it's that kind of thing where it's like the medicine is so designed for other animals or other things created from the earth that it pairs up without as much risk. Um, but I, of course you can tell me if there is as much risk, it seems like the benefit risk ratio is as, high. Compared to what? Then a psychiatric drug, for example. Yeah, I think there's room for that discussion. I mean, so uh, a, pa a parallel example here is, um, you know, cannabis is, is federally illegal in the United States and most countries. And um, uh, for a period of time, I'm, uh, from, from what I understand, uh, you know, black market availability of chemicals began to include synthetic cannabinoids. They, these were compounds that, that were, you know, similar to, for instance, THC, but not exactly similar. And, and by, by the kind of vagaries of, of scheduling law had not yet been scheduled. And so technically weren't really illegal to sell or buy or use until the DEA found them and then scheduled them. And then the chemists would go to the next iteration of, of that compound and like slightly tweak something in the chemical structure. So they made a new compound that yet wasn't scheduled. And, you know, the synthetic cannabinoids evolved into compounds that could still get people high, but became incredibly dangerous. And, and, you know, cause heart attacks and psychosis and all these other things. And it got to the point where people were starting to worry, Oh my God, all these synthetic cannabinoids, the terrible plague on people who are using them. It's too bad. We don't have a natural alternative that's safe. Uh, and, you know, relatively speaking, yes, cannabis is incredibly safe compared to some of these synthetic cannabinoids. Right. And I think there's room to uh, be open to um, some kind of natural biological synergy between mushrooms uh, and uh, that are psychoactive and and in our brains. I have trouble um, uh, accepting, a, you know, fully accepting an argument or, or, or a story that involves some kind of like intelligent design involved in this. Um, but but another way to pose the question is, well, why did God or the universe or the great electron in the sky or whatever it is or evolution create so many ways for us to hallucinate? Why are there so many question, natural yeah. sources, plant sources, fungal sources, and other sources? Why are there so many sources of, of, of compounds that, that lead us to not hallucinate, but have a psychedelic experience? So I've had some family members and friends uh, use ketamine with a psychiatrist and in a controlled environment. Um, and it seems like a lot of people talk to me about using ketamine and whether they should and and what they're thinking about. And as far as I understand it, ketamine is not a natural substance the way that a mushroom is. It doesn't come necessarily from the earth. I believe it was created in uh, the 1980s as, as a horse tranquilizer. Um, but you could tell me more. How does ketamine differ from, you know, these other forms of psychedelics that you're studying that are more plant-based? And are you seeing the same results as far as you know benefit risk ratio and effectiveness and all that yeah so so yeah ketamine 
I don't believe has natural sources. But it also kind of begs the question of what's a psychedelic, right? Um, and, and this is currently an ongoing debate in the field. Uh, right, the word like, a, uh, like yeah. a something that makes you hallucinate versus something that was created that that is like plant-based. I'm saying there's a difference between anything that makes you hallucinate and something that's plant-based and makes you hallucinate. But you're right, there's, there's a lot of debate about what that is. Psilocybin, you know, the typical psychedelic approach to therapy here involves giving someone a massive dose of psilocybin or LSD or something similar and, and uh, leading them to a radically altered state of consciousness to, during which protocolized therapy typically does not occur. Therapy occurs before and after, but uh, it's really kind of putting someone into this space, letting them work it out themselves, and then we, and then and then we do aftercare. Whereas MDMA therapy, uh, there's psychotherapy that occurs before and after the, the the experimental drug sessions, but there's also therapy that occurs, talk therapy that reliably occurs during the drug session, and that's primarily where a lot of the work is supposed to end up you know, beginning, if not occurring. So th those are differences between the therapeutic approaches and the, and the therapeutic models of these drugs, at least at a high kind of rough level. And, but, but the interesting thing between MDMA and psilocybin is that the durability of effects seems to be itself incredibly remarkable. Uh, this is almost certain to differ between indications. In, in our weightless control trial in patients with major depressive disorder, we observed uh, half of the patients were in remission from depression for at least a year after two separate administrations of psilocybin. It sounds like with the MDMA uh, and treatment of PTSD that patients, I don't want to use the C word, but I think other people are using the C word, like make cure people of their PTSD or give them at least incredibly durable, long lasting relief from their PTSD symptoms. Ketamine does is completely different. It's, it's, it's a different drug. It acts in different receptors in the brain. It acts in NMDA receptor antagonist, um, and, and uh, which, which may lead to increased glutamate levels. There are some that argue that despite differing apparent uh, initial sites of pharmacological action of these drugs, despite binding to different receptors, these drugs all lead to the same downstream effects. You know, there's some like second messenger signaling that occurs in the brain that leads to an upregulation of this and a downregulation of this, and they eventually all lead to the same place. I'm not sure that we fully uh, can support that yet with evidence, but suffice to say, ketamine, uh, as as administered in ketamine clinics now around the country, maybe around the world, um, is administered intravenously or intranasally, leads to a, an almost immediate antidepressant effect that lasts for like a week or two, depending on who you ask or what paper you read. But um, there's, uh, you know, at least not systematically any talk therapy that accompanies this. There's no special treatment of the space in the state that people are in when they have this experience or when they receive this treatment. There's no preparation. There's no real integration in the same way that classic psychedelic therapy occurs. And, um, and people have to come for repeat doses every week or two or four, and it becomes this chronic thing that may over time may reduce an efficacy for a given person. And open questions include, but are not limited to, what would happen with ketamine if we did package it in the same kind of procedures that we do psilocybin and MDMA administration? Could we get longer lasting effects? Unknown. Some people are trying this. It's not clear that there's a real good signal there yet. But um, I mean, they all make you feel different than you feel right now, right? Right. So if that's the definition of psychedelic, then yeah, sure, they're all psychedelics. But you know, my 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 really unfair kind of straw man argument here is that the caffeine that I drank this morning has mind manifesting <laughs> effects and changed the way. I know. That well, I then we reality. could say alcohol too, right? Absolutely. Um, so where do, where do we draw the line, right? Yeah. So. With ketamine, do you think that the popularity of its use right now is more so regulatory? It's just easier to get your hands on because of the federal laws around psilocybin? It is a scheduled drug, but it's it's available in the pharmacy. Doctors can prescribe it. Everybody that's using it right now, unless they're using the kind of the, the FDA approved intranasal version, um, they're prescribing it off label, but they can do that as physicians. And yeah, I think I think access is part of the proliferation here, but also because it does have such immediate effects in the people that it works for, right? People go, they're like, oh, wow, this worked. And, you know, instead of taking a pill every day that's going to have all these side effects that may or may not work, and it'll take me six weeks to determine whether it'll do anything, going once every couple of weeks to my clinic to get a shot is easy, right? 
But do you, do you find that most of the trials you've done with psilocybin, there's an immediate effect as well? Well, for a lot of people, it seems to be the case. Yeah. So I mean, it's, it just so happens that psilocybin is not approved as a medicine and can't be prescribed in a clinic. Right. So that's, right. I mean, that if, if you're looking for an answer as to why people are accessing ketamine and not psilocybin, it's because they can access ketamine and they can't yeah. access psilocybin except for clinical trials. Right. Right. Yeah. That's, that's the conclusion I kind of came to and so many people were being mm-hmm advised to use it, but I was thinking it's also just because they could get it. <laughs> it's like, um, so with all of that in mind, um, yeah. who are the people that you think really should be using psychedelics? And I, you know, we can talk about the differences between them for, for another hour, but just generally, and the people who really shouldn't be using them. Well, so far, you know, no classic psychedelics have been approved as medicine, so they're not available in the clinic yet. Uh, my expectation is that, you know, once we get enough data, once the phase three clinical trials are approved, that uh, my expectation and the expectation of many is that it's, it's possible the FDA may approve psilocybin for the treatment of major depressive disorder. At that point, you know, it, 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 it's, it's likely that people will begin to set up clinics to offer psilocybin therapy for patients with depression. Um, one of the interesting things about all of this is that we don't know really what the limits to the indication space are. Um, you know, all these studies that I rattled off that just, just at Hopkins, not a, let alone other centers in the country and the world, you know, people are almost throwing it at the wall for everything. I, I fear that it's going to be seen as a panacea and be treated as a panacea and i absolutely don't believe it is a panacea or we should expect it to be a panacea and i think we should be worried and skeptical about that but i do think there's a there's a great potential for treatment of mood and and substance use disorders at the very least with psilocybin one of the things that seems to be more and more apparent is um a potential risk uh, for patients who have a personal or family history of psychosis. And so this is something we were theoretically worried about, uh, but there's, there are a couple of case reports out now and, and uh, kind of fits the pharmacology that um, especially patients who may be prone to experiencing mania um, or ma- having manic episodes, it, it, it may be uh, you know, quite a, a, a profound risk for these individuals. And some of that evidence comes from uh, case reports that have been recently published in the literature. Other evidence for that comes uh, anecdotally through through uh, you know uh, personal reports, uh, you know online and, and and to myself and others. Uh, but also the the kind of pharmacology of this thing. Uh, it's been known for some time that patients with bipolar one disorder, patients with bipolar, well, they can experience mania. They may be at risk uh, for for having a manic episode or precipi- precipitating a manic episode if they're administered serotonergic antidepressants like SSRIs. And so it's you know it's even more of a struggle to treat patients with uh, bipolar disorder uh, because not only uh, can it can it be a really kind of pernicious and chronic illness, but you can't you know, leverage the the first line therapy for unipolar depression. In the same way, it really it really feels like people try not to tap on the serotonin system when treating patients with bipolar disorder. Uh, why should we go in with a heavily serotonergic drug like psilocybin or LSD to, to treat patients with bipolar disorder? Also, the history of thinking about these drugs as psychotomimetics. You know, I said you know they don't they don't seem to me to be good models for psychosis, but there's enough overlap, uh, at least, you know, even, even the hint of similarity of the experience to psychosis makes you wonder whether it's a safe and a, and a, and a reasonable thing to try to, to, to administer these compounds to people who are at risk for psychosis. That seems to be like one of the biggest signals for risk here that we can understand, at least in the psychiatric realm. Yeah. My, my mother, she had bipolar disorder, sorry, schizoaffective disorder and mania yeah. and stuff. So this is all very close to my heart, but what I saw from her experience in the last couple of years of her life were just a really, she was so debilitated by the pharmaceuticals that were offered. Um, it, it was really like you described it such a dulling rather than, you know, there was yeah. just nothing left, um, on earth to feel, um, even though it took away mania. So I, you know, I'm always hopeful that 
um, for these major psychiatric illnesses. Um, not that anxiety and depression are, but they're more varying degrees of it in society versus like, if you have mania, you have mania, you know, that there's some more humane treatment that comes along, um, yeah. because the pharmaceutical approach, I just found that the risk benefit was not, it was not strong. It was, right. <laughs> or rather the, the quality of life it produced was the same misery in a different capacity. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so on that topic, I mean, there are many different pharmaceutical drugs for many different kinds of mental illnesses, um, both acute and long-term, but do you think, I mean, using your visionary, uh, mind that, that 50 years from now, um, psychedelic medicine will eventually replace pharmaceutical drugs as the go-to treatment for some or all mental health disorders and, you know, why or why not? I think it's possible that there's a future in which the, that could be the case. Some of the challenges that people are rightfully kind of worrying about in the approval of these drugs is scalability, right? You know, currently within the current models, we require at least one, if not two, uh, licensed mental health practitioners to be in the room for eight hours when people are having a psilocybin experience. If we were talking about LSD, that would be 12 to 16 hours. We need, you know, uh, adequate screening uh, and, and uh, you know, intense psychotherapy that occurs before and afterwards. And so, you know, uh, it, all of that adds up. We, we still don't know truly if people can be treated while maintained on uh, antidepressants like SSRIs. Weaning people off of SSRIs, even if you think they're not working at the moment, could be a risk. Sometimes people are taking SSRIs, they don't feel they're fully working. They may not be fully working, but they may be doing something. And even if they're not doing enough, taking you back off of those SSRIs could put you in a worse state than where you were. And so, and, and, and there's thought that, you know, especially for certain drugs, taking you off of that SSRI and then putting you back on it at a later state that might, that that drug may not work even as poorly as it did before. It may not work as effectively. <laughs> and so the, there are a lot of risks that really need to be, you know, weighed here, uh, you know, when we're talking about treating real people and, and, and impacting their lives. And a lot of these questions haven't been answered, but assuming we can, find some kind of drug, you know, treatment. We can treat people that are maintained on SSRIs, for instance, um, in the future. And assuming that uh, insurance companies uh, agree to come behind and reimburse some, if not all of this, then, you know, there, there are some reasonable arguments here. You know, uh, if, if it all comes down to durability of effects, if the effects that we found in our clinical trial and our list control trial of 50% uh, remission from depression at, for at least a year after treatment. If that's real, if that if that sustains kind of scrutiny and, and interrogation, and the, that's predictive of how this will work in the real world, then gosh, like you know, 16 hours of therapy uh, or 20 hours of therapy, the cost of that pales in comparison to the like lifetime cost to the individual and society for someone suffering from depression, right? Like, well, and, and think about, I mean, just how much talk therapy costs hours and hours and hours of it versus something that might bypass or, or be the equivalent of three years of talk therapy in a single session. I mean, the saving could be there, even if, you know, two people yeah. are required in the room and this or that, you know. Exactly. And if you can show, prove those numbers to insurance companies, I, I hear that th that's the kind of stuff they respond to, but there's a lot of other exciting stuff going on too. Um, you know, people are looking into shorter acting psychedelics, uh, such as DMT, there have been over the past month or two, two studies that show that an intravenous infusion of DMT, dimethyltryptamine, um, can allow you to really carefully control the depth and length of a psychedelic experience. Imagine, imagine being able to use a, a DMT infusion to get someone into a psychedelic experience for an hour and a half, and, and imagine that that's enough to have the full therapeutic response, you know, and you can control that really precisely. So instead of having someone in for eight hours for a psilocybin session, you bring them in for two hours to have an hour and a half long DMT session. And that makes things a whole lot more cost effective. Um, there are other people who are looking into psychedelic analogs that are not psychedelic. These are, you know, taking the trip out of the treatment. Um, I'll go on record by saying I, I, I believe the trip is part of the treatment. And I don't think these drugs will work in the same way that the classic psychedelics currently work. But, you know, the argument that was returned to me at a conference recently, which I have to agree with, is that, you know, uh, 
yeah, fine. You know, if the trip is worth is necessary for the full treatment effect, that's great. But there are plenty of people who we probably won't be able to administer these drugs to people with psychosis, people who have really high blood pressure that's uncontrolled other, you know, who knows what other populations will, will come to find are, are, are really more of a risk than we understood. Don't those people deserve some chance as well? And of course they do. And, and, and I think, you know, I think, I think they're trying to engineer the, the new generation of chronic antidepressant drugs. You know, you may take uh, a drug that was derived from psilocybin, uh, but is not psilocybin. And if you take that pill daily or, or, you know, every other day or every three days, and if you get 50% better than you were before, hey, that's valuable too. I think all of these things are on the table. They could all be entertained. I'm, I'll believe it when I see it, frankly, but I would, be love, I would love to be proven wrong on that. But, but in, you know, backing up for a second as well, with, within all of this hype, we still have to acknowledge that there's still so little known that weightless control trial that I keep referring to that we conducted was in all of 24 patients. Um, up until recently, the largest clinical trial had been in, in uh, you know, 50 people, uh, you know, and, and there was a recent uh, phase 2B uh, clinical trial published by Compass Pathways that had treated 233 people with treatment resistant depression. That had absolutely been the largest uh, modern study to date with the psychedelic for treating uh, a, an indication. And, and up until that point, there had been in on the order of hundreds of people in the entire literature, modern literature, that had been treated for any indication whatsoever in a randomized controlled trial that was peer reviewed and published. So like, the number of people in the world that have been treated with psychedelics in a randomized control trial is still minuscule compared to what we usually expect um, in terms of generating an evidence base to approve something as a medicine. And there's still a million questions we haven't answered. So we're still early on in this, but I think we can still be excited because the effects are so large so far. Um, we just have to temper that by understanding that, you know, we're not there yet. And and in that large clinical trial in 233 people, it was for treatment resistant depression, which are patients who are more acutely ill and more chronically ill than, than patients with major depressive disorder writ large. By definition, they're more difficult to treat. Um, they may be more intractable. The uh, therapeutic effects in that in that published uh, study were not as remarkable as everybody expected. And in the high dose treatment group, there were uh, five, uh, I think, severe adverse effects. I don't think there were serious adverse effects. And there's a difference there, right? Um, it was just like a very severe, but not, you know, uh, it, it's unclear. We have to go back to the paper and read it again to, to make sure. But um, you know, adverse effects that we hadn't expected as a field um, and hadn't really seen quite yet uh, in our clinical trials. And so it may be the case that patients with treatment resistant depression aren't going to respond as well to this because they don't respond as well to anything, um, or they may not be as likely to respond, or there are greater risks involved in their potential response to psilocybin. But patients with major depressive disorder overall may respond better to, to, to psilocybin than they do to typical first-line treatments. Again, you know, there's, there are just so many questions to answer here. Yeah, wow. Well, it's an exciting time to be in a field with so many questions to answer because you can be working on answering them all day. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. I know I mean, we've covered a lot of different uh, ground in this topic of, of psychedelics. Um, and, uh, I just, I wanted to make sure to have, you know, someone who really understands and is in the trenches of how it's being used, how it's effective when it's not effective, how it compares to psychiatric drugs, because I think there's a general feeling that the tools available right now for treating mental illness or just to improve mental health, aren't that effective in a doctor's office. You know, we're seeing like there's tremendous uh, connection between diet and mood and um, the gut microbiome and, yeah. you know, these different um, mental illnesses. So, so that's always been the part that I've been interested in and covered. And so I, less so on like a actual, you know, uh, medicine. And until I started to learn about psychedelics and, and this kind of bridge to me between the natural world and the the powerful impact I've seen on various chronic diseases and, and certainly on killing microbial infections of herbs and how these plants aren't exactly that, but they're kind of in the same field. And so is the brain maybe responding to them better um, because of this, you know, connection um, and, and, and from what I've seen, how powerful herbs can be in other capacities. So that was my, that was my interest in it. 
Um, and it sounds like certainly there's a piece of that, but there's just still so much to study that it's hard to say whether that's why they're more effective or or why the research is promising at the moment. An interesting kind of side note to all of that is that we've never used fungal matter in our studies. Uh, every study that we've conducted in near, I, I believe almost every study conducted in the world in the modern era has used pharmaceutical psilocybin or LSD. People can extract psilocybin from fungal matter and then and then ingest it. But we, uh, you know, I think almost all of the studies that have been conducted have been on synthesized psilocybin. Interesting. Oh, okay. But, 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 you know, and the is angular, that because it's, it's just easier to control and measure? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Easier to control and measure to, to, to demonstrate how it was produced and, and satisfy the FDA in suggesting that it's pure and unadulterated and that we know exactly what it is. Um, that's not to say that, uh, you know, psilocybin doesn't have some kind of natural connection because obviously it's it's a naturally occurring compound. It's just, you know, yeah. A lot of other questions that we haven't even touched on uh, that, that, you know, ca the cannabis field is getting into are, are, are questions uh, within the realm of entourage, right? Psilocybin containing mushrooms do not only contain psilocybin. There are many other kind of analogish uh, compounds like uh, norpsilocybin, psilocin, norpsilocin, biocystin, norbiocystin, and other things that exist right along psilocybin in mushrooms that produce psilocybin. And the question is, well, do these things interact? Do they have their own interesting therapeutic effects? And we haven't touched on any of those things in our studies yet. We'll get there maybe. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. It's almost like extracting vitamin C from strawberry without understanding how it interacts with the fiber and all the other yeah. components, um, on the human body. So that's very interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I analogy. hope you, I hope you study that because I'd love to know what the, uh, outcome of that is. Fred, thank you so much for your time. I know you have, you're a very busy man and there's lots of research to be done and lots of people to treat who are suffering. You guys are making great strides at Hopkins in this field. And I'm very proud to uh, be an alum and to to know that this work is going on. So thank you very much again. And, um, you know, if there's anywhere that people can follow along with the work, will you tell us? Is there some sort of like a newsletter or something like that? Yeah, yeah. Th thanks so much for, for your interest in this, Adrian, and, and for inviting me on the on the podcast. Um, you can you can follow our work at our website, hopkinspsychedelic.org, all one word. And uh, on that uh, website, you can find a link at hopkinspsychedelic.org slash newsletters. Uh, you can sign up for our newsletter. They go out often, I, I think, quarterly at this point, where we give updates to our research program, papers we've published, you know, interviews we've done, uh, new studies that are coming online. And uh, you can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook at JH Psychedelics. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you again. I look forward to seeing all these exciting developments and um, helping more people when they feel like they haven't been able to get helped by the things that are available on the market today. Thank you. Thank you.